Y'all have been singing about heaven, singing about going to that city and all of that. Turn to Revelation chapter number 22 and verse 17. This will be the last message in this particular little series that we I've uh, been preaching on on Sunday night for the past few Sunday nights. This will be the last message, I think, on that. And uh, in verse number 17 of chapter 22 on page, let's see, 1353 is what it would be. Verse number 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. We're talking about Jesus coming back. And the Spirit and the bride are saying, Come. They're wanting Jesus to come. Amen. And... Let him that heareth say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, not the Lamb's book of life. People whose names are in the Lamb's book of life can never take it, be taken out. But now we're talking about the book of life. And out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now it doesn't take long for a true convert. I'm talking about somebody really born again, not somebody putting on religion, but somebody that's really had an experience with Christ to start thirsting thirsting for Jesus to come back. That's something that's just in every born again child of God. We want Jesus to come back. We're singing about it. We're singing about we're going to be in heaven someday. How true that is. Every child of God has a yearning down deep within to have Jesus return. Now who gives the child of God that yearning, that desire? It is the Holy Spirit. Now what the Spirit of God and the church are saying right here in verse 17, let everyone that heareth say, come. Now we can't get our glorified bodies until Jesus comes back. But when he does, we'll get it. And there won't be any more doctor's offices, won't ever be any more visits to the hospitals. Won't that be grand? Many of us find ourselves praying, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Now right here in verses 18 and 19 are very important scriptures that are overlooked by many clergy today. I want you to notice the one speaking right here. It's not some little frivolous freak. This is the Son of God. This is the Almighty God that we're talking about that's speaking here. And it's Jesus Christ Himself. He said, for I testify. Jesus said, for I testify. So he is in heaven right now as uh, the Almighty God, and he closes the prophecy of Revelation with the words, I testify. And y'all just sang about, let me testify. I love him. He's been faithful. Hasn't he been faithful? I've seen Jesus do things this year that I tell you I didn't think he would do. I mean, I knew he could do it, but I didn't know for sure where he would or not. Bless his holy name, he did. He's always on the job. Hallelujah. Jesus is in heaven with the heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, and those who have read, heard, and received the facts of this book. Now here we have the agreement among all of these. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the church. The church is a very important entity on earth today. It belongs to God, lock, stock, and barrel. The devil can't harm one hair upon the head of the church. He can't do one thing about your salvation and mine. I mean, you and I can't either. You say, Brother Sammy, you could slip and fall. No, I may slip and fall, but he won't let me go. He promised to never let me go. You say, Brother Sammy, you're a crazy nut. Well, hallelujah, just let me keep on being a crazy nut. I believe what the book says, and I believe that when I'm not even faithful, he is. That's what the book says. Whenever I remain, whenever I'm not faithful, he remains faithful. So here we have the Almighty Savior and God the Father endorsing everything in this book. Now this is the book of Revelation in particular, but not only the book of Revelation, but the entire canon of Scripture. Now then he says very dogmatically and emphatically here, if any man shall add unto these things. Now you know, uh, there are some people that don't know what is, is. Huh? You ever heard that? 
Well, look, if I'm going to start a library, and I'm going to put my first book in there, and then later on I get another book, and I put this book in there, what have I just done? I added to my library, didn't I? Huh? Does any kid in here not know that when you put two together, that's one plus one is two? That's adding two, my library. All right, then what if I get to the place to where I say, I'm going to sell out. I don't want my library. Start selling my books. All right, I sell that one. So I've taken away, right? Does anybody not understand that? Do you not understand that that and this, this is in addition to that? And is that understood? All right, this taken away from that means that is that and this is gone. Okay, he said, don't anybody add to this book. Don't anybody take away anything from this book. Now, brother, you're in danger. I'm talking about big danger, and these preachers can't believe that. But I'm telling you, they're going to stand before the judgment one day, and they're going to be greatly surprised. I want to tell you what the book says right here. I'm not going to read one thing into it. I'm going to just read what God said. Now, then he says very, very plainly, that not to add unto these things. God shall add, if you do, God shall add unto him the plagues. And you know what a plague is? There are many of them in the book of Revelation spelled out. We've studied them before. And he said these plagues that are written in this book will be given to those people that add to this Bible. That's dangerous. <coughs> people just don't count the Bible as the Word of God. They just count it as another book. I bet, I, I'm, I'm telling you, you better respect this book because it is the infallible Word of God. There are severe, severe punishments right here spelled out for the person or persons who add to this book. Now, we have definite proof right here that Revelation is God's last message to man on this earth. We have this great book called the Bible. <clears throat> we have it on our lap. We're fortunate to have the Word of God as we do. We have this great, great document right here to read and to study and to love. There are 66 books in this Bible. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. The Old Testament is preparation. The Gospels are manifestation. The book of Acts is propagation. The epistles are explanation. The revelation is consummation. So in the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch it's, are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, and so on. The first five books are known as the Pentateuch. So we have in the Pentateuch redemption. From Joshua to Esther, we have organization. From Job to Lamentation, we have poetry. From Isaiah to Malachi, we have sermons. It's amazing now how the Pentateuch has never been called into question by Jews, by Protestants, or by Catholics. All of these religious bodies will recognize the Pentateuch as being authentic. Isn't that amazing? They all recognize the first five books of the Bible. Chronologically, the Pentateuch covers the period of time from the creation of the end of from the creation to the end of the Mosaic era. Now, we do not know the date of the creation of the universe. Nobody knows that. The Bible didn't tell us. The Bible does not tell us some things, but God keeps them for himself. And that's his business, his business, his business. If he wants to tell you and me something, he'll tell us. If he doesn't, then we don't need to find out, try to find out any other way. If it's not in the book, don't worry about it. Some people say things about, oh, you know, you need to do this and do that and line up here and line up there and meet their standards. I said, look, I don't care about your standard. I don't care about your standard. I care about God's standard. Amen. And I tell you right now, if it's in the Word of God, I try, I do try to adhere to it. But if it's not in that Bible, I haven't got time to worry with it. 
So you say, well, Brother Sammy, how long is long hair? That's been argued down through the years and years ago. We were on that old legalistic bandwagon. We were miserable. We didn't know what to do and where to go and who to talk to and who to fellowship with. Got condemned for every little thing we did. Brother, we were miserable. But one day I woke up, praise God, and I realized I was free in Jesus Christ. Uh, and I didn't have to answer to Dr. Wigglejaw. I didn't have to answer to any man, thank God. All I had to do is be concerned about what Jesus said. And boy, I got free, and I'm free now. I don't care what Dr. Wiggle Joe and Dr. Doodiggle out there, what they say about me. They can say what they want to say. They don't put bread on my table. They don't help me one bit. They don't give me a dime for anything. I'm here, praise God, by the grace of God. And it's all the grace of God. And I don't need them. I'd rather just have Jesus Christ as my king and my leader and my Lord and my Savior, I'll follow Jesus the best I know how, and I fail Him. I do fail. But see, that's where He keeps, where somebody would condemn me to hell fire if I fail, and say, oh, Sammy K., you know, he did that, or he said that, and he's going to hell. Say what you will, but Jesus says, oh, no, he's not going to hell. He's been washed in my blood. Hallelujah. He's saved by the grace of God. I got him in the hollow of my hand, and you'll never get him. Hey, can you realize that Jesus loved even me and got me out of that crazy life that I was living before I got saved and put the joy bells ringing down deep in my heart? Chronologically, now the Pentateuch covers that period. And we don't know when cre uh, the universes were created. But we know that uh, G the Genesis begins with an account of creation. But soon uh, it narrows into the interest of human beings. Uh, Adam and Eve were entrusted with the responsibility of caring for the world about them, but forfeited their responsibility and privilege through disobedience and sin. Subsequently, man grew worse and worse until finally God sent the judgment of the flood. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God said, I'll destroy all flesh from the face of the earth because of sin. Men were so evil, their thoughts were on evil continually, all the time, just like it is today. <clears throat> today, people are thinking more about evil than anything else. Have you ever noticed, and I didn't notice it back years ago when we were watching those old John Wayne and Randolph Scott movies, <clears throat> we thought they were <clears throat> the best things. They're, they're Sunday school lessons compared to what they have now. But on every program, every program, the best program they could put out, Hollywood, they always had a bottle. Every program, check it out. They always had a bottle of whiskey. And somebody's getting drunk. And if they come in and they, you know, got a problem, they say, give me a drink. Give me a drink. They sold this country on liquor and beer, and we didn't even know they were doing it. It was so subtle. Now everybody's drinking, and it's supposed to be okay. It's still not okay. It's never going to be okay for people to drink whiskey and beer and all this stuff. Man, I could preach all night tonight, but I got to hurry because y'all are getting sleepy. <laughs> Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So then, in a while, God chose Abraham, and so on and so forth. Through history, God performed great acts and gave us this book so that we could be knowledgeable and, and knowledgeable of his plans and his program so we'd know where we are. Now, right here, we are tempted to go into Hebrew history, and I may hit just a little bit a little, uh, for, if I have time, but... If all religions can accept these books of the Pentateuch, why can't they accept the whole Bible? That doesn't make sense to me. Either it's all God's Word, none of it's God's Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, the Bible says. So we know that God promised never to destroy all living flesh from the face of the earth by water again. But there have been many, many floods, and year after year floods increase in America and around the world. China, and other places. Floods are something that people fear now because they are so rampant in the land. God could be warning people and reminding people, you know, at one time I destroyed this whole thing by water. I'm not going to ever destroy all of it by water again because I promised I wouldn't. 
and he put a rainbow in the sky. Every time you see that rainbow, you can say, there's a promise from God. You know that he's not going to destroy all flesh by water ever again. It'll never happen. But God can destroy a lot of flesh by floods, and he does every year. It gets worse and worse. God has been long-suffering and merciful to the human race for years and centuries, but he warns human beings that there is another judgment in the future, and you better prepare. He gave more scripture so man could be in the know, and he gave us this great book of Revelation. He proclaimed a man's rebellion. He proclaimed and prophesied about it about man's rebellion and man's rejection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives one last book for the canon of Scripture, and that's the one that we're in right now. We're about to finish it. We're going to close it out tonight, Lord willing. And that will be <clears throat> the last message now. This is the last message to man that God will ever give before we meet him in the sky. You'll never get another message from God other than what you've got in your lap right there tonight. Anybody that says we've got another Bible or the Book of Mormons, that's just of the devil, the plain devil. That is not of God at all. Brother, no book, no book God ever gave, but this one right here. He never gave another. And so you and I had better just thank God we got it. And we got the truth, and the Holy Ghost bears witness with our spirit. Hey, you are right. You are right. Keep on, son. Keep on telling it. That's the way it is. This book, as well as all New Testament books, are worthy of all acceptation. Those who refuse to believe the New Testament and are the book of Revelation will surely suffer loss. Now here, he warns that no man had better add something to his last message. This punishment will be great. God said to those who ignore his warning, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. You can interpret that any way you want to, but everybody here knows what a plague is. Everybody knows you don't want one. But he said plural. He's going to put many on people who try to add to this book. I pity those people that wrote the NIV and the NAV. And the good news for modern man, bad news for modern man, the living Bible or the dead Bible. Anybody that wrote those stu things, you ought to read some of that junk. I got it in there, but I got trash written on it, so my kids, when I die, won't believe I believe that. Because I don't believe any of that. I believe what we got right here, the King James Bible. And you won't go wrong with this book. So let me remind you and really emphasize this truth tonight. When the last amen was said in this book, that was all God would give man until we stand before his grace. Now, true Christianity and true church history will bear out the fact that since the last amen now, God has not spoken to anybody else to write anything about him. The last amen was amen. That's it. So God has been silent, arguing with an earthly judge doesn't get you anywhere because an old earthly judge, whether he's right or wrong, will usually stick by his decision. And you can't move him. You can't hardly budge him. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think that's rough, you wait till you try to argue with the judge of the universe. You won't get an argument in. You won't be able to say, well, wait a minute now, God. No, you ain't going to say, wait a minute, God. You're not going to say, no, let me straighten you out. You're wrong on that. You won't dare open your mouth. You'll be silent before the judge of this universe and you'll keep your mouth shut and listen to what he has to say and you won't tell him anything. You won't argue and say, well, I don't like what you say, God. People say, I don't like what Sammy K preaches. That old eternal security once saved, always saved. Where do you get to heaven and find out, brother? That's the only kind there is. Yeah, there's no other kind. I got saved one time. That's time for time and eternity. And I don't have to go back and do it over and over and over again. Jesus doesn't make a mistake. I was talking to Bert Hoffman on the phone before church tonight. And I brought up how that I said the other day that Jesus Christ has never tried anything. You know what? He's never tried a thing. He's always done it. He doesn't try to save anybody. He saves you. Hallelujah. 
He didn't try to get you and me out of sin. He didn't try to wash our sins away. He washed them away. When we called upon him, it was done, praise God. When he was on the cross and said, it is finished, hallelujah. He meant it's finished, thank God. It'll never be repeated. It'll never be repeated, praise God. Calvary covers it all. Thank his name. He said, this is my word to you. Do not add anything to it. This is it. <laughs> when people claim to have new revelation from God outside the Bible, they're absolutely motivated by demons or the devil himself. God speaks to man only through the word of God and through his spirit. Now, my friend, that's the only way you'll ever hear from God is from the Bible and the Holy Ghost. You're not going to have a ball of fire come flying down out of the sky and hit you in the head and wake you up and then reveal things to you. That'll never happen. If you can't believe this book, you won't ever get saved. When that rich man in hell said, send, send Lazarus to my, bro my father's house. I have five brothers and warned them not to come to this awful place called hell. Warned them. And Abraham said, that's, uh-uh. And I'm paraphrasing. He said, that can't be. He said, they've got Moses and the prophets. You know what Moses and the prophets was? That was the Old Testament. They had the Bible. They had the Word of God. And he said, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded that one arose from the dead. So if you don't believe this book, you won't believe anything. You've got to believe the book. Hallelujah. People say, well, I just can't believe the book. Well, that's your problem, friend. You're in bad shape. You better be getting down on your knees uh, somewhere and meditating <laughs> and thinking about, oh, my God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm in a bad way. So this punishment may be here on earth partly and partly in eternity. We don't know. You can interpret that any way, but you know what God said. That's what I'm concerned about. Remember over in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it promised a blessing to those that read this book, hear this book, and keep this book, and obey this book. Four things that if we do concerning this book of Revelation, we're going to be blessed even reading it. Now, here in Revelation 22, 18, we have a stern warning of judgment on all those who tamper, who tamper with this book. Verse 18 warns about adding to the book. Verse 19 warns about taking away from the book. Now, for adding to, there is the judgment of adding plagues. In taking away, there is the judgment of taking out that person's part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, you know, the Lamb's book of life is different than the book of life. And I'll just try to explain it this way. Everybody's written in the book of life. Everybody. Everybody's name is in the book of life. And when you get saved, it's put over here in the Lamb's book of life. And brother, you're secure in the Lamb's book of life. But if you take away from God's Word, you haven't gotten into the Lamb's book of life yet. Your action proves you haven't been born again. All right, if you take away from that book, God will take your name out of the book of life. And if you're not in the book of life, you'll never get in the Lamb's book of life. Is that judgment? God said, you, do, you better believe it is. You think I'm joking? You think I'm playing around? You go ahead and mess with my book. Only lost people will try to change God's book. Now, you can judge that any way you want to. If somebody's ignorant and doesn't realize that a NIV is a wrong kind of Bible, then I believe they can be saved. I really do. But once they're confronted with a mess, I believe they'll drop it like a hot potato when they're confronted with it. But I'm not saying everybody's got an NIV in their hands going to hell. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying once they're confronted with the truth and shown the truth, then compare them, lay them right there, and I can do it. I can do it. I can show you the bad. I can show you the good. And then you still hang on to the bad. You, you didn't get saved. You're not saved. You're lost. And I'm talking about preachers too. Lost preachers. The devil has as many preachers as God does. And they're everywhere. So for taking away, it's a bad thing. And I do not believe a true born again person will even desire to change the Bible. I mean, who wants to change God's word? I mean, in my heart, I don't want to. I would never want to change God's word. Now, preachers who change this book or agree with those who change this book, 
They're not saved any more than anybody else. And they're not called from God and of God, and they're not sent by God. No born-again believer can ever have his name taken out of the book of life, so, uh, out of the Lamb's book of life, because he's born again, and he's in there to stay. Now, people who tamper with God's Word, they counsel their right to eternal life in the Lamb's book of life, and even the book of life. Now, when ignorant, educated, or stubborn people tamper with the Word of God, they're tampering with God. In, in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you're talking about God when you're talking about tampering with the Word of God. You're going to change God? Huh, that's silly. Absolutely ridiculous. And how you educators out there can go along with this thing, I think you're stupid. Plum stupid. I don't care if you're the president of a university, you are dumb as a dog. It won't bark. That's right. Gets my blood boiling. Righteous indignation or mad or whatever you want to call it. Identify it. But if you think that you're smarter than God and wise because you tamper with the Word of God, you'd better regroup. You better sit back down and think this thing over. Repent. Jesus gives us His promise right here in verses 20 and 21. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. I'm going to come. And then He said, Amen. Amen. He's coming. And when He comes, it's going to be just like that. And all this sorrow that we've known will seem like it just didn't happen. It'll be gone. And so, surely I come quickly, He said. Now, even so, come quickly. Many of us are saying right now, Lord Jesus, come. We're wanting you to come. We want to be with you. We want to be where you are. And all these things are true and faithful. Every jot, every tittle of this revelation is absolutely true. You know, I wanted to, I thought I might get into a little history, <clears throat> but I'm not. But I'm just going to mention something to you about how this thing I'll do it very hurriedly. But Adam lived 930 years on this earth. Seth, 912. Enos, 905. Kenan, 910. Jared, 962. Enoch, 365. And he didn't die. He was translated. Methuselah was the oldest man. Lived to be 969. Lamech, 777. Noah, 950. Now, for 1,656 years, God dealt with Gentiles. There were no Israelites. And then the flood came. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was spared. And he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, Shem, from him came Alpashad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahar, Terah, and Abram. Abraham. That's from Shem's line. From Ham's line came the people of Asia and Africa. And Japheth, the people of Asia and Europe. Now I want you to note that all of Shem's descendants to Abraham could have known Noah. The lifespan after the flood was cut in half. Then in the days of Peleg, it was con it the, God confused the language and at the Tower of Babel, and again, the lifespan was cut in half. Then God called out a man. Remember, no Jews. There hadn't been a Jew. Didn't, the world didn't even know anything about a Jew. But God called a man, Abram, out of the earth of Chaldees, down in Mesopotamia, in a land of idolatry, called him out to go to a land that he would show him. Abraham had to believe God and trust him and move out. And so he did. Abraham. And his name was Abram when God called him. And God changed his name to Abraham. And from Abraham, the wife Keturah, came the people of the east, the Chinese, etc. And then from Ishmael, born by Hagar, from Ishmael came all these Arabs. And then from Isaac, that was the chosen seed, God told uh, Abraham, in Genesis 17, 21, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, not Ishmael, and not with Keturah's people, but with Isaac. Now, Isaac had two sons, Esau 
and Jacob. From Esau came the Edomites, Genesis chapter 36, and from Jacob came Israel. The first Israelite was Jacob. The Bible tells us in Genesis 32, 28, to Jacob God said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Iskar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. They were the 12 sons of Jacob that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel is the apple of God's eye. And even though they rejected Jesus as Messiah at His first advent, they were set aside by God, but not destroyed. But God set them aside and began to call out a church, both Jew and Gentile. And everybody that's been born again is in the church, Jew or Gentile. And one day, pretty soon, God is going to rapture the church out of this world. And we're going to meet Him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. During that time in heaven, seven years according to time, we'll be in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we'll come back to the earth, to the Mount of Olives, riding on white stallions, Revelation 19. But during that seven years on earth while we're in heaven, doing all of that, the Antichrist will be ruling on this earth. Seven years. And uh, Israelites are going to have to suffer like they've never suffered. And they have suffered, bud. When they rejected Jesus as Messiah, His first coming, God set them aside and scattered them all over the world. They've suffered everywhere they've ever been. The Jews have. They're suffering now. But you wait till the Antichrist comes. He's going to give them a, a peace treaty at the first of the tribulation period, and they're going to think He's Messiah. And they're going to just worship Him and embrace Him. But in the middle of the tribulation period, He's going to become so proud He'll set Himself up as God in the temple and refuse them their sacrifices Break, break that covenant with them, that agreement with them, and then they're going to be wondering, now something's wrong. This is not our Messiah. And they're going to be looking and searching, and God's going to show them sign language, you know, in Revelation 12 that we studied not long ago. And there'll still be a lot of those Jews that'll follow Antichrist. Many of them have their heads. Uh, many of them will follow Antichrist, and, and, and He'll take care of them. But the remnant is going to refuse the Antichrist, and there will be a lot of those with their heads chopped off. They'll start cutting heads off for sure then. But there'll still be a remnant that'll get through that into the kingdom. And that's what it means when it says, two shall be sleeping. One will be taking the other left. Two shall be grinding at the meal. One will be taking the other left. That's not the rapture. That's the revelation. That is when God takes some of them into judgment and the others are left for the kingdom. That remnant will go into the kingdom, and Jesus will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem on this earth and rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And you and I will rule and reign with Him. Now that's just kind of a little gathering of it, uh, but there's a lot of details in between. But you and I have something to look, look forward to. And you think that I'd tamper with this book not on your life. I'll never tamper with God's Word. It is the truth. And Jesus said, I testify. I testify. This is it. So you, you stick with it. You'll be okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Word of God that is truly a lamp unto our feet and a, a, a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father, that we can see these things tonight because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you'll help our people to stand true to God, really stand for this book and not compromise it, not join with these other uh, critics and people that believe in these other books. I just pray that we'll stay by the stuff until Jesus comes for us. Bless the church and let it grow and go for the glory of God. And if there's anyone here lost tonight, help them to come to Jesus before it's too late. And what you do for us, Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.